I've often said that uh, what prepared me for Vietnam was uh, a couple of sports. I think sports in general did. I had 11 varsity letters in high school. I had seven varsity letters in college. If you can imagine the crowds that I was in, especially as a wrestler, me and another guy in the middle of a mat and the, the, just the roar. Well, that's not exactly the same with bullets coming by, but you know what? You can transfer that. And as far as going without water, I'd gone without water uh, for a while, trying to cut weight sometimes in wrestling and, and without food. But really, in, a, in the situation that we were in, survival, you don't think about water because water isn't going to help you. you got to survive. You don't think about food because you might take your last but you better take every one of those moments to make sure that you keep yourself alive. And I never thought twice about going into the kill zone to get my men because I loved them and they loved me. And I would do anything for them. I wasn't about to walk out of there that first night when I was wounded and the, the lieutenant told me to get on the helicopter because I'd rather be dead than to hear that one of my men was killed because I wasn't there to do my job. Oh, I was an infantryman and we were flown into a hot LZ. Uh, choppers were being shot down. We were under heavy fire. Jim, of course, was our company medic, you know, for our, for our company and platoon actually. But uh, you know, we were under heavy fire, heavy enough fire that they were shooting helicopters out of the sky. But in any case, we went out on this patrol and we left one platoon in the secure perimeter. As we got out there, um, you know, we, we ended up walking into an ambush. This is the 13th, uh, a very serious ambush. We were outnumbered, heavily outnumbered. Uh, we had some men killed and a number of men wounded and during all of that time. And Doc, actually, Doc was wounded during that period. And uh, he chose, obviously, to stay in the field, and thank God he did. But, um, you know, he assisted many of the men back into the perimeter carrying some of them, dragging others. There was no place that I lost hope. Um, I did. I had a conversation with the Lord in the trench line when I had dragged a man with a, I had a man with a stomach wound that I mentioned before and, and I had taken him into the trench line. And while I was there in the trench line um, working on him and then wondering how I was going to carry him without losing his organs out of his body, something came over me from nowhere. It had been since I was a little boy that I had told my father that I loved him. You didn't say that. Men didn't say that to each other. Fathers didn't say that to sons. Sons didn't say that to fathers. I knew he loved me, and I assumed he knew I loved him. We, we showed that. So the conversation that I had was, uh, Lord, if you get me out of this hell on earth so that I can tell my dad face to face that I love him and give him a hug, I'll be the best dad and the best coach and the best teacher that I can be. And this peace came over me that it was no longer in my hands. It was in the will of God's hands. And if the will was that Jim McLuhan was to die, it actually helped me to make decisions quicker. It added on to that mental discipline and focus that I'd gotten from those sports. And so it was his will. If I made it out of there, which I did, then it was time to me for me to take care of my side of that bargain. On the 14th, Captain Carrier was given orders for us to move towards Nunyan Hill. We all knew it was a bad idea. He knew it was a bad idea. He didn't want to do it, but he was ordered to do it. So off we go. All the platoons are moving out now. So we have no security back in our holes that we've dug. So we move out. Everything's fine. As soon as we move out, the NVA move in, close the back door on us. So we can't retreat to that. Didn't know it at the time, of course. And as we're walking along, I look to my right and I see a large man walking across an opening across the rice paddy. And I thought it was one of our men that we had lost the day before on the 13th. So I started yelling over here, over here and waving my arms. And when the man turned toward me, he had an RPG rocket propelled grenade on his shoulder. And shortly after that, the ambush took place on the point platoon. 
and all hell broke loose. This guy was firing at us with the RPGs, and we had an online assault. They were throwing CHICOM grenades at us, and we were throwing anything we had back, and it might have even been a rock, because they don't know if it's a grenade or not, and they were doing the same to us. So this went on throughout the night, uh, on ground, online assaults. I looked to my left, and I saw these three NVA 20 yards away. The man in front had a rifle. The man in the middle had an RPG. And I, I'm sure they were targeting our officers you know, to take that out. And if they could stop the radio calls, we were really, really in trouble. Not that we weren't in trouble to begin with. But in any case, there was another man behind him with a rifle. And Doc, being the, the, the ball player he is, put a grenade in the guy's pocket, basically. And that was the end of that threat. Captain Carrier gives Doc a strobe light. And Doc puts it in his helmet. He crawls into the middle of this football field, rice paddy, and is holding it so that this resupply helicopter can come in and drop some ammunition to us. And the helicopter comes in, lights out, and he's hovering. And the door gunners are strafing the area, and they're shooting into our perimeter also at the time. And they're in the, a panic because the sky is red and green from the tracers from the enemy trying to shoot this helicopter down. Well. Captain Carrier realizes if this thing goes down inside our perimeter, we're all done. So he, he waves them off. He tells them they have to leave, but the, they never kicked any ammunition off. After that, there was silence, I mean, amongst us, and we knew we're dead men, you know? And the word went around, save a bullet for yourself. It was save one for yourself. The word was passed around, so. So in, in essence, you know, that went on throughout the, the night, and they were going to bring in an Arvin force, and Rumor had it that the Arvin force wouldn't come in unless they were in battalion size, you know, not a company. They wanted enough men to, to secure the area. So they did come in, and then we were evacuated, flown up to Nunyan Hill. And then we continued to patrol off of there and uh, clean up the, the mess that was there from combat. I'm, do I'm here because of Doc. Trust me. Lieutenant Clark put me in for the uh, Distinguished Service Cross, the second highest. And I didn't find this out till about four months after the battle. And they told him, oh, he's only a PFC. Uh, they don't get that. Put him in for the Bronze Star, which is quite a bit lower. I mean, it's two more lower than, but I didn't care. I, I just wanted to get home. So I came home and I told my father and I told my uncle about it. Then right after I retired from teaching, my uncle came to me and said, I've got a, an appointment with the uh, congressman for you. And I said, for what? He said, to get that medal you should have gotten 40 years ago. So I'm going to skip a lot. We, it took six years and three congress persons. Uh, Debbie Stabenow was the last one that I ended up with to get it into the Army Board of Decorations. Then it went to the Pentagon. And when it got on the desk of Ashton Carter, he said that the Distinguished Service Cross was not high enough. Yeah, let, let's face it, I'm pretty lucky that I'm still alive, you know. A lot of people die before they're 71 years old. Uh, and and um, secondly, to be able to be the caretaker for the rest of those guys, um, I'm honored uh, to be the caretaker. Uh, I did my job, and, and a lot of people are calling me a hero and my wife gets mad at me when I say you know I'm not a hero I just did my job but um, I'll, I'll absorb that a little bit okay uh, there were some heroic times and, and actions during that but I didn't do it to receive any kind of a medal uh, I didn't go there to to uh, earn any medals um, I'm very proud to accept that from the President of the United States and the people of the United States of America, and I hope I live up to the magnitude of that particular medal.